Uh, I'm going to give you some uh, of the recent results that we've had from the uh, Lothian birth cohort, um, which is a study of uh, ageing in, uh, in Scotland, where I'm, where I'm from. I don't know if you can tell. I could, put a, I could put an even stronger Scottish accent on. I've been told that my Scottish accent is not incomprehensible. Yeah. Well, I could talk like this for the whole time if you want a Scottish accent. <laughs> but I won't do that. I'm afraid that this talk is going to be full of um, quite depressing graphs that all look like this. Um, and, and there's nothing I can do about that, because when you look at ageing, all the graphs go like that. And, uh, and, and I'm trying to understand the structure of ageing. That's the idea. So this is the first phenomenon that I'm interested in, which is age-related cognitive decline. Um, and as you can see, not all of the uh, 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 sub-domains uh, of intelligence uh, decline as, as we age. So some things like vocabulary um, uh, uh, and other, other things, knowledge and so on. So crystallized skills, um, uh, if anything, increase and stay fairly stable as we get older. But abilities like speed and reasoning and, uh, and memory uh, do decline rather precipitously from about uh, the mid-20s. So I'm, I'm 27 and so I've just got into my cognitive decline now and it'll continue until I am, according to this graph, until I am dead, basically. So that's uh, a nice thought. Um, and the other thing uh, that I thought I would talk about in this uh, uh, presentation is um, not just cognitive decline, which happens you know, even outside of things like dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, the other thing I thought I would talk about is, is age-related physical decline as well. So here we have a, this is a study that came out a couple of years ago that put together lots of data on, uh, on grip strength. So it's using a, a handheld uh, dynamometer to measure uh, grip strength in, uh, in males and in, in females on the, the left and the right there. And you can see that grip strength, a bit like the cognitive abilities actually, increases uh, in, in, in childhood to about the mid uh, 20s and then declines and declines and declines. And obviously it's, it's stronger in males, as you can see there, than, than females. All the different colors are, are different studies that they all put together. And it's beautiful, it all lines up really nicely. I think this is a really nice, a really nice figure illustrating a quite depressing uh, aspect. Sorry, lots of this is depressing. I'm, I'll try not to be you know, too downbeat about it. But the question uh, that has often been asked about uh, uh, aging is whether there are common causes involved. Uh, so this is a 2001 paper that I've got a little um, clipping of here uh, talking about the common cause hypothesis of cognitive aging. Um, so there's, they described that they had evidence not only for a common factor, so that is that generally cognitive abilities all age uh, together, but also their associations with vision and grip strength, uh, and, and this is a, a cross-sectional paper. And you know, so the idea was that there might be uh, not not lots and lots of specific processes that all cause aging on lots of different aspects of our our, our body and our mind, but that there's a common cause, there's a common um, uh, degenerative process that causes cognitive decline and uh, physical decline. And, uh, and that was their hypothesis here, and it's been tested many times in, in many papers. The, the problem is that a lot of those papers are, um, are use cross-sectional data, and when you're doing aging research, what you want really is to have longitudinal data where you follow up the same people uh, over and over again and observe their, uh, their, their decline. Um, not, uh, not everyone declines, but most people do. Uh, on average, there's always decline. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going to try and be less... Uh, I'm really very, very sorry about this. Uh, which is where our study comes in. Uh, our study, the Lothian Birth Cohort, 1936, um, uh, started off um, in, in 1947, really, when all our participants were age 11, when the, uh, the country of Scotland decided for the first time ever uh, of, of, of any country to test the entire nation's IQ. So every single 11-year-old child who was 11 at the age of, uh, uh, in the year 1947, um, did uh, uh, an intelligence test, and um, the, uh, the well, there had been a previous one in uh, in 1932 actually, and the reason they did it again was that they were worried that uh, there was a kind of dysgenic decline in the in the IQ of the of the population. And actually, what they found was the opposite: the the Flynn effect, which you might have heard of, which is that the IQ in in 1947 was actually higher than it was in uh, in 1932. But um, but anyway, um, the data were kind of looked at a little bit at the time, and then they were kind of well, they were literally put into folders and shoved away in a basement and people forgot about them. Um, until my, uh, uh, my boss, uh, Ian Deary, uh, discovered, rediscovered these data in, in a vault 
under the School of Education in, in, in Edinburgh and uh, managed to invite um, many of these people back to do the same test again um, when they were age 70. So they did the same test when they were, when they were 70. We got 1,091 of them to come in and do the same test. Then uh, very kindly, they've, they've repeatedly come back. They came back when they were 73 and uh, when they were 76. And right now, as we speak, uh, in, in Edinburgh, they're being tested again um, at the age of uh, 79. So we've got really quite good uh, uh, longitudinal data on, uh, on all these uh, participants. And we all also know what their IQ was when they were uh, uh, 11 years old, on a really good test, it turns out. Um, if you're interested in the study, there's an um, article a couple of years ago in, in Science magazine, a kind of a, a magazine article um, about the, his the history of the study and some of the findings and so on. The journalist from Science was spent hours on the phone to us talking about all the details. It was like a, a great example of science journalism because um, you see a lot of really bad science journalism, but that was a really, that was a really nice example. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in the study, and that's what they look like. Um, so that's not all of them, but that's some of them. They, they got together for a reunion, and uh, they, they, uh, they did complain that they had to walk up all those steps uh, to, to the back. Um, and they complain more and more every time they come back to the reunion every three years. We're going to have to find a different venue, I think. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's the Lothian birth cohort uh, there. So when they came in to do the, the, the IQ test, they didn't just do the, the single test. They actually did a whole uh, battery of cognitive tests. So we heard about cognitive batteries earlier on today. So they actually did a, a wide range of cognitive tests um, and also a whole bunch of other uh, uh, stuff, including some of the physical measures like grip strength that I, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, so there's, these are two genuine members of our, of our cohort. So this is, I, mean, I don't know if he was kind of deliberately going mm, when he was doing the test to make it look like he was thinking really hard. But um, so that's one of our members doing a, uh, the block design test. I think there's a very similar one in one of the cabinets uh, outside. And uh, this is uh, one of our, our members doing a, um, a lung function uh, measure, uh, um, forced expiratory volume. So you have to blow out as much as you can in one second and it turns out to be a really good indicator of general health. Um, they also did grip strength, and we also had them walking up and down a corridor to see how quickly they can walk um, uh, as well. So those are the physical measures that I'm going to be talking about uh, in, in, this, in this talk. Here are all the uh, cognitive tests that we did with them, um, and what happens from so the average age was 70 at the first point, but actually there's a, few, there's a few people who were younger than that. And the average age was 76 at the last point, but a few people older than that. So we've actually got from about age 67 to 77, the, the range covered at three, at three measurements. And this is just a, a summary of what happens to the, the cognitive tests. Again, I told you there's going to be lots of graphs pointing downwards. Um, so you can see, I don't know if you can read all those. There's matrix reasoning, block design, which is what you saw the, uh, the gentleman doing on the last slide. Uh, spatial span, uh, uh, um, the national uh, adult reading test and the Wechsler test of adult reading, which are kind of uh, vocabulary type measures. Uh, there's a verbal fluency test. Then under memory, we've got logical memory, which if anything seems to be going up with age. Um, and I suspect that's because we use the same little story for them to remember each time and they just remember it from three years ago. So it's not a, it's not a brilliant not a brilliant test um, but we made sure that we didn't change any of the tests that's the that's kind of the the, the, the point uh, verbal paired associates so you know you have to learn a word that's paired with another word uh, uh, digit span uh, the classic digit span test and then on the on the processing speed uh, thing we have uh, tests of um, pencil and paper processing speed so you have to tick off all the letters that you see um, or, or find a letter in amongst a jumble of other letters. Um, and we also have tests um, of processing speed measured by computers. Uh, so an inspection time task where images are flashed up onto the screen and you have to respond to them really quickly. And uh, a reaction time task where a button, uh, a, a light goes on, you have to press a button really quickly. So a, a really nice wide range of tests. I hope you, I hope you agree. Um, and just to show you what happens to those tests. So just to zoom in on the speed tests, um, this is the sort of data that we that we get um, uh, uh, for for the, the decline. So the green is the first wave, and the orange is the second, and the purple is the third wave. And this is what happens um, with with age. Uh, you can see that choice reaction time. That's when there's one one of any four lights might go on, and you got to you got to press the button as quickly as possible. Uh, that's the seems to be the, the strongest indicator of aging in the in the in the cohort. It seems to it, it, it declines steep uh, more, most steeply with age. Um, so that's 
uh, some of our tests. And in uh, one of the studies that I'll talk about now, um, one of the most recent ones that I've, one of the most recent analyses that I've done, we, uh, we compared them to what happens to these physical measures. So just to, to show you the comparison, the physical measures, um, so there's the lung function, forced expiratory volume uh, declines with, with age. Uh, walking speed, I've, I've flipped it around so that um, it, it, it's speed rather than, you know, um, their, their, their speed is getting slower rather than their, you know, their time. We measure it in time, obviously, but I flipped it around. Uh, and, uh, and grip strength declines a bit, but not actually as much um, as, the other, as the other measures uh, do across, the, across the, uh, the, um, the, the decade that we've got there. So um, depressing again. Uh, so what we look for is uh, 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 the general factor of uh, cognitive ability, which we've heard about uh, in previous talks. There's this G factor that's been talked about since the early 20th century that explains a large amount of variation amongst all cognitive measures, amongst the levels of all cognitive measures. So we're, you know, we're totally, you know, that's one of the best replicated results in psychology, um, is that we know that, this, that there's this uh, uh, general factor of cognitive level. But what we're also interested in is, is there a general factor of cognitive change? So if you take all, the, all these slopes of decline in all the tests, do they tend to decline together? Do people who decline in their processing speed also tend to decline at the same rate in their uh, visuospatial ability? Do people whose memories decline also decline at the same rate in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in speed, for instance? And then also we're interested in, uh, in the same thing for the physical functions. So can you get a, a G factor, a P factor maybe, a pH factor of, uh, of, uh, of, of physical um, uh, ability uh, out of these three tests? And then do they all change at the same rate? And if they do, that would be some evidence for this, uh, this common cause hypothesis. And even better evidence for the common cause hypothesis would be if the general factor of cognitive change correlated with the general factor of physical change as well. And it'd be really good evidence because it's not from a cross-sectional study, but from a longitudinal one where we have really good measures. Um, and, and, and not only that, but a very narrow age range. Pretty much all these people are around about the same age. It's not like we've got a longitudinal study that has a, a wide age range and then they're followed up two years later and then followed up again. They're all around about the same age. And that deals with a lot of the problems of, of, uh, of uh, uh, age variability at each, uh, at each wave. This is the uh, uh, model that we use. It's a, a latent growth curve model. So you see the, the test at age 70, the test at age 73, and the test at age 76. And you extract two latent variables from, from those. You extract the, the intercept variable, which is the, uh, the, the kind of the, the G factor, I guess, the, the general um, uh, factor of, of how good they're doing on that test overall across, across age. And then the slope factor, which tells you how, how much that test is changing. And you can aggregate all these factors uh, up into, a, into a, a, a hierarchical structure, as I'll show you on the next uh, uh, page. This is a paper we've got under review uh, at the moment. Um, just got reviews back, in fact, for that. And uh, so this is telling you, the, the, the font I'm aware is way too small for anyone to, to, to see. But it's telling you the standard thing that you find in all intelligence research, which is that levels of cognitive abilities uh, uh, you can extract a very strong general factor at the top, um, which explains, in this case, 40% of the variation across all, those, across all those tests. So that's all the tests that I showed you on the graphs um, uh, earlier, from uh, so visual, spatial, crystallized memory, and, 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 and speed. So no, no exciting finding there. The, the, you know, Charles Spearman in the 1920s was talking about this stuff. However, um, it is interesting to, to do the same thing with the slopes, as I, as I said, to look at, see if there's a general factor of slope. And indeed there is. And in fact, interestingly, the general factor of slope is even stronger than the general factor of level. So around half of the variation in all the cognitive tests are uh, in their decline is explained by one general factor of decline. So there really does seem to be a common cause in terms of cognitive aging. Uh, something is, something, some aging process in the brain uh, is, is, is causing decline in all, of these, in all of these factors, would be one interpretation of that data. What about the, the model of the levels in terms of the physical functions? Well, you 
it's a less strong uh, common factor, but you do find uh, a common factor. They correlate positively together. So people who, are, who have stronger grip tend to have better lungs and tend to be able to walk faster. Again, not a massive surprise there, but what happens when you try to do the, uh, the slope one? And this is the exciting one because I don't think anyone's done this before. What happened when I tried to run that model uh, is illustrated in the following uh, little GIF, which I've got here. So it started off really, really well. And then, unfortunately, that happened. And that, I think, is probably my favorite ever thing on the internet that I've ever seen. <laughs> Let's just watch that again. Oh, it's, just, it's the fact his trousers come down as well as the fact he falls over. It's beautiful. Just one, sorry, just, just, let, just one more time. <laughs> uh, anyways, so just stop now. Stop that now. Oh, well, uh, uh, okay, I'll go, let's go back to this. I was unable to get uh, a, a, a model of the slopes working in, 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 this, in this data. Uh, that I couldn't find a general factor of, of, uh, of, of physical slope, which made me wonder if there actually are any correlations, if, if the slopes are positively correlated at all. And so let's just zoom in in a bit more detail into what all these individual measures are, are, are doing. I'll, I'll put it up again at the end, maybe. <laughs> Oh, there's another really good one that I can show you. We could just watch YouTube videos all day, I guess. But anyway, sorry. Uh, let's. Right. Um, here are the. Um, so, just looking at a general speed factor here. So ignore that for now. Just just looking at the walking, which is in blue, grip strength in pink, and uh, and lung volume in, in orange. There. So you see, they are correlated together. There's a general factor of level. They're correlated together at the at the uh, uh, at baseline at age 70. And these are some models that say, well, if you, what's your level of physical function at 70? And does that predict how much you're going to decline in uh, your cognitive abilities and in your other physical functions uh, up to age 76? So this is a kind of predictive uh, uh, correlation, which might be really useful in terms of you know, predicting who's going to age badly and so on. So in this one, people who have better speed, who are faster cognitively uh, at age 70, um, have uh, you so just to just to uh, say if these correlations are positive, uh, it means that, that, that it's better aging happening, that there's less negative aging, and if they're if the lines are dotted, it means they're non significant. So, people who have higher speed at age 70 uh, decline slower in their walking speed, so cognitive and physical speed seem to be related. People have better lung function do better in their walking in terms of, so the, the, I don't know how to interpret a lot of these results, so maybe you can help me, but, uh, but this is, I'm just showing you what we've got. Walk speed predicts changes in cognitive speed, that's good, uh, and grip strength predicts changes in speed and in walking, but not in the, the lungs. And here's the really interesting one, that the changes in, in, in lung function and the changes in grip strength and the changes in walking speed are, are not significantly correlated at all. So people who decline more in one of them across the, 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 the six years of the, of the test, that, that doesn't really tell you anything substantial about how they decline in, in the others, which I was totally not expecting. Uh, that's a completely unexpected result. Um, so you do find that the cognitive speed uh, changes alongside grip strength and changes alongside uh, walking speed, but, the, but, the, but the, the, the physical functions themselves are not changing at the same, at the same rate. Now, you might say, uh, well, loads of those cognitive tests involve like moving your finger off the button really quickly. So, so obviously, phys people who can physically move faster are just, uh, all you're saying is that people who can physically move faster can physically move faster. You know, get off the stage, you're wasting my time. However, there is a, one of the cognitive tests we used um, doesn't involve m movement at all. It involves no um, uh, uh, movement, uh, uh, no quick movement, um, and that's inspection time, where uh, a thing is flashed up on the screen, and you have all the time in the world to say whether it was the the the, the one with the dot on the right and the one or the one with the dot on the on the left. So there's no actual speeded response, and you actually find that that correlates with the, the changes in, in inspection time, so IT, correlate with changes in, 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 in walking speed there. Um, and then this is just uh, general uh, intelligence. It uh, doesn't change alongside any of these factors. So it really does seem to be only, only speed uh, changes correlate with the, with the physical changes. 
So this is not what I was expecting. Uh, given the evidence from, from uh, common cause models and, and, and so on, I really wasn't thinking that, that I, would, I would get results like this. But I guess you get surprised sometimes. It may well be that we don't have enough power to detect correlated change in only six years. It may well be that we need to wait for our nine years of data or even, or even further um, to, to, detect these, uh, to detect these changes. So just to sum up this bit, it really does seem that there's a very clear general cognitive change factor. So that can, that can go alongside the general cognitive factor that we all know about from, from, you know, psychology, from psychology textbooks. Um, although a lot of psychology textbooks don't like intelligence very much. But it's, it should, it's one of the best replicated uh, findings that we have is the, the general factor of cognitive ability. And I think um, every, every sample I've seen uh, seems to find this general factor of cognitive change. Ours is one of the, 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 the best to test it in, and we find it, uh, we find it there. Physical abilities don't seem to change in the same, in the same way. There seem to be more specific processes operating uh, on the different parts of the, the body that are being measured by those, by those physical uh, measures. Cognitive speed and some aspects of physical speed uh, change together, but not the, uh, the, the, the general, the, the G factor of, 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 cognitive, of cognitive function and, and cognitive speed. So that, weirdly, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why, again. And so this might actually be evidence against the idea of a, of a common cause in, in, uh, in, in, in aging when it comes to cognitive and physical aspects. And I don't like this result because I'm the kind of guy who wants to aggregate things together into, cognitive, into, into higher order factors. I'm that sort of person. You know, you meet people like me all in bars and stuff. I'm not one of those kind of guys. Uh, but but, I, but I, totally, I totally don't. Uh, uh, um, I wasn't expecting this, this result at all. So we may well have evidence against... This, uh, this idea of, of common causes in aging uh, of the body and aging of the, of the mind. So that's, that's one uh, part of what I was going to talk about. The other bits I was just going to look, I was going to talk to you about how we've related these physical function measures to other aspects um, that we've measured in the Lowian birth cohorts, 1936. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about brain imaging, although we'll hear more about that uh, tomorrow, and um, a little bit about uh, genetics, and we'll hear more about that in the next uh, talk. So uh, here um, is the numbers that we have for brain imaging. And I think the Lothian birth cohort is, is really, really good in terms of um, uh, numbers for, for, for brain aging. Normally, you, you look in the neuroscience literature and you see n equals 15 uh, or whatever. It seems like to get a paper published in, I'm just sounding bitter now, but to get a paper published in Nature Neuroscience, you've got to have like four people in your study. Um, so uh, we, have, we have a really, really good numbers at, at age 73 and age 76. Unfortunately, we didn't scan them at age uh, uh, 70, so we don't have the three waves yet, but we are scanning them now, again, at 79. And we measured their, the volumes of gray and white matter. Um, we measured their, uh, the, the hyper intensities, which I'll show you in the next slide. And we made general measures of diffusion tensor imaging. So. Um, uh, fractional anisotropy and mean diffusivity, which index the movement of water molecules in the white matter tracts of the brain that connect up important um, brain areas. So uh, they, they've been found to correlate, in many studies, they've been found to correlate with, with cognitive um, abilities. And in fact, in our study, um, which I won't show you now, we, we find that as these aspects of the brain uh, get worse, uh, so do cognitive abilities. So um, this is just a slide of some uh, of the brain images from the Lothian birth cohort, 1936. All these people are 73 years old, and you can see there's a, a large amount of variation in the, in the just, just, you know, you don't need to be a neurologist to see there's a huge amount of variance in, in, in the health of their, of their brains. Um, so this, I could get the laser here. Uh, this person up the top here, is, uh, I've got hardly any space. So when, when you're young, the brain tends to fill up the whole of the intracranial uh, cavity, right? So this person here has got hardly any atrophy of their brain. Their brain's uh, h hardly shrunk at all and, uh, and, and doesn't have any of the white matter hyperintensities, which are these areas which appear um, uh, very, very bright white on the, on the, the, the flare uh, brain scan image and, uh, and, and might be might indicate, they're, they're kind of like scars that appear in the brain and they might be related to um, vascular disease and small vessel disease, which uh, is related to risk for stroke and, and, and also dementia. Um, so 
you see this person down here has very large white matter hyperintensities and, uh, and has had a fair amount of atrophy. This person had a great deal of atrophy of their brain um, uh, as, they've, as they've got older. You hardly ever see any white matter hyperintensities in, in young uh, people. So it's, it's, it's the case that this person has, has aged faster than, than, than this person. So um, that's one thing you see. We, so we measured, we measured the volume of the, of the hyperintensities, the volume of the gray and white matter in the brain. Uh, and we also measured uh, these white matter tracts. So these are, are uh, areas, uh, tracts of white matter that connect up important aspects of the, of the brain. We measured uh, these from the corpus callosum, the genu and the splenium, uh, which, which connect the, the, the hemispheres. And we also uh, measured the left and right versions of the anterior thalamic radiation, the frontal cingulum, the uncinate fasciculus, the arcuate fasciculus, and the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So these are all well-known uh, tracts that you'll see in any sort of neuroanatomy uh, textbook. Keep talking about textbooks. I, I've never talked about textbooks before. I don't know why I'm talking about textbooks today. Anyway. Um, and so what we did was we aggregated all the measures of uh, fractional anisotropy, so the water molecules moving through these uh, tracts, um, and mean diffusivity, so the amount of general um, uh, uh, diffusion of water molecules in the, in the tracks into, my favorite thing, general factors. Um, and it, it turns out to be the case that, like intelligence, you can extract a general factor of, uh, of, uh, of, of white matter integrity from, from measurements in all these tracks. So all these tracks are, are like, this is the matrix reasoning test, and this is the block design test, and this is the, you know, you can, you can aggregate them together into a general, into a general factor. And uh, in a study that I've just uh, submitted, we took these general factors, we took the volumes of the gray and the white matter and the, and the, and the, the hyper intensities from, from uh, uh, scans like this, and we said, okay, here's loads of stuff that we know about these people, including the physical, the physical functions. Um, what, what can we get that predicts change in, uh, in, in the brain with age? And this is unfortunately, again, uh, very difficult to see, but I'll just talk you through. Uh, on the left-hand side, so in, in both of these, if it's green, it's good. I've just flipped everything around, so, it's, so if, if it's green, it's good, and if it's red, it's bad. Uh, the, the little asterisks imply statistical significance, as you, you might have come to expect, and, uh, and the, the weight of the, of the color uh, tells you about the effect size. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, the prediction of the level, so just the correlation that each factor has with the, the brain level at age 73. And on the right-hand side, you have the correlation that each factor has with brain changes. And these are the factors. Uh, uh, sex, so I, I always put this up. I should maybe say gender. I don't know what people, what people prefer. But I don't mean sex. What I mean is biological sex. I don't mean like we've asked them how much they have sex, because I don't want to know anything about that, to be quite honest. Uh, 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 although, although, one of them once came up to me in one of the reunions and said, you've asked us everything else. Why don't you ask us about our sex lives? Because I find it creepy, that's why. Anyway, sorry. So, um, so sex, sex is one thing. Um, physical fitness is the thing we're really... Because this is what I've been, I've been talking about. So that's, a, that's this general factor of, of physical fitness level that I showed you in the last, the last part. Grip strength, lung function, walking speed. Allostatic load, which is a kind of a, a, a general indicator of bodily stress uh, that's taken from... Uh, lots of um, biomarker, mo uh, so inflammatory and metabolic biomarkers, uh, their blood pressure, their BMI, um, and various uh, uh, blood-related things. Cholesterol, lots of cholesterol in Scotland. Um, their number of health conditions that they have is rated in a questionnaire. Their socioeconomic status, their, their uh, intelligence, um, so from, from their childhood, age 11. How long they stayed in school whether they smoke, how much they drink, whether they have the well-known APOE uh, allele, which is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, which I recently found that uh, I have. I, I, I sent my uh, saliva in a bottle to, um, to you know, 23andMe, the genetic testing company. You should do it, it's really good. Although you do sometimes find sad information, like you have the APOE allele. So I can look forward to a rapid cognitive decline uh, myself. And, uh, and this, um, polygenic score for schizophrenia. We, we, you, we, you can ask me about that, but that's, I'd have to give you more details on that. We're interested in the physical function for now. So the immediate thing that you notice, I think, is that 
all of the way more correlations with the level than there are with the slope, with the change across time. It's much, much easier to find things which correlate with the level of the brain at age 73 than to find things which predict the brain's change from age 73 to age 76, which is a bit annoying when you're wanting to you know, try and work out ways to predict who's going to age badly and, and, and who's not. So let's just, let's just have a look. Physical fitness, better, people with better physical fitness have better uh, uh, aspects of all of these brain uh, functions. So at, at age 73, they have larger gray matter, larger white matter, better diffusivity, so their, their white matter is better integrity, and they have lower levels of these white matter hyperintensities with age, um, um, that, that grow with age. However, if you use physical fitness to predict subsequent changes, uh, you still find some effect, especially for mean diffusivity. It's very protective against change in mean diffusivity, it seems. But there's very, very little going on there compared to what there is uh, at age 73. And then there's this huge part of the diagram, which is just absolutely nothing, apart from you know, one little probably spurious correlation here. Um, when the, when they're, you know, for, for level, there's an awful lot. And then uh, you start to find possibly effects of these genes kicking in, in terms of the, the cognitive change, that are not related to the, the brain's level uh, at age uh, 73. So it may well be that these genes are more important um, for uh, later in life. They, kinda, they, they, they come online and cause you to, uh, to have a faster decline if you've got the wrong uh, alleles. Um, but they're not really relevant for predicting uh, the, the size of your brain uh, that's, that's developed throughout your life. So that's our kind of, uh, our kind of star figure for... Um, uh, our, our brain uh, stuff recently and uh, there's a lot I mean you could sit and look at this for quite a while and come up with loads and loads of questions and pro pro probably will uh, you know you can have the slides if you want and and and, and get in touch but we're, this paper is just under review now so um, there's plenty to I'm sure the reviewers will have plenty to plenty to say and plenty of criticisms as you uh, were talking about earlier on uh, okay so that's the brain and I'm just going to give you one more thing uh, I've talked for half an hour now and I I know people just don't want to hear me go on for too long. So um, I'll talk about one more aspect, which is uh, uh, DNA methylation. Um, we have uh, started to do, and this is, this is now bringing things around into the, the future of the, of the field and what we might expect uh, to see in terms of uh, new and, and exciting uh, measures that, that, that haven't been looked at uh, before. Um, in terms of aging, it seems like a really good predictor uh, of aging is the level to which your genes, uh, your DNA is methylated. So let's just have a look at that. So this is a, an unspun uh, strand of, of, of DNA. Uh, and you see these little uh, groups here, these methyl groups, which are attached to what's called a CPG, which is where you have a, a letter C and a letter G in a, in a, in a row. Um, this happens if, 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 I, if I, you know, measured the pe people's DNA in this room, you would all have a very wide range of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of genes um, methylated. And what this does in kind of layman's terms, and I am very much a layman when it comes to genetics, is that it, it, it turns genes on and off, right? So this is the idea of epigenetics, is it, it, it's, it's gene expression, switching genes on and off. And methylation changes across the lifespan. Um, you start off with, uh, with, with some genes methylated and they become unmethylated, and some genes become methylated when they, when they, when they weren't before. Um, we're not really entirely sure of the causes of that. So you see this, this person has a, has a C uh, um, in, their, in their DNA uh, here, which is not methylated, but it is this, this C is here. So what we've done in the Lovian birth cohort is we've taken uh, blood samples um, uh, and looked at their DNA and across all the different uh, uh, types of cell in the blood, we have uh, asked um, the proportion, uh, so we've, we've tested the proportion of, um, of uh, their, their little C sites here that are, uh, that are methylated across time. So that's, that's a, new, a totally new variable. But what, what could it possibly mean? Well, a couple of very interesting studies appeared in the last few years um, about this idea of methylation age. Um, so uh, Steve Horvath has been leading a lot of this stuff, although there was a previous paper by, I can't remember the first name of this person, Hannah, um, where they created an entirely new uh, indicator of age. By What they did was they took, they took samples, in some cases very large samples of people, did, did that methylation testing, 
and used a sort of machine learning algorithm to uh, predict the person's age just from looking at their DNA. Right? So they, this isn't the Lothian birth cohort, this is previous, previous samples. But they found, they, they basically built a, a, a methylation predictor that correlates 0.96 in both cases with the person's chronological age. So this is a bit like, um, you know, being able to, to just take a blood sample from people and, and tell exactly what their, what their age is. It's not a bit like that, that's exactly what it is. It's, 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 it's a, a really, quite remarkable, uh, really quite remarkable thing that you can do. And if you think about the applications to things like forensics, you know, you read in the newspaper, they find a dead body and they don't know what age it is. Sorry, I shouldn't be talking about dead. Uh, we, well, but you know, they don't, they don't know what age the dead body is. You could use, you could use the methylation uh, of, the, of, that, of that person's DNA to find out almost precisely what their, what their age is, which is quite remarkable. Um, anyway, so this methylation predictor can be used in entirely different samples, and we used it in the Lothian birth cohort. Um, this is what it looks like, by the way. That, that correlation of 0.96 is, is great, but it's not a correlation of one, and therein is the interesting part. Because you can see that there are people who are off the diagonal. There are people whose DNA, so say they're 70 years old, and their DNA gives them an age of 69. And there are people who are 70 years old, and their DNA gives them an age of 71. So there are people who are slightly older in terms of their biological age than they, than they are chronologically. And there are people who are slightly younger. So again, it's like looking at someone who's you know, 30 years old, and they're really, really wrinkled or whatever, and you go, OK, that person's not doing too well in terms of aging. Or you look at someone who's 70 and they look super young and you think, well, maybe this person's going to do, going to do pretty well. Um, and it turns out that you can get an indicator of, so you, you, you calculate the difference in, uh, their, between their chronological age and their methylation biological age. And, uh, and you can get this ind index of fast aging or, uh, or slow aging. And one of the things that this predicts in the Lothian birth cohort studies is uh, mortality. Um, people who have, so this is, uh, these are survival curves, um, so this is the, the, the chance of being alive at, uh, at any particular age. So this is the older group, the Lothian birth cohort 1921, and then the younger group, the Lothian birth cohort 1936. So it started when they were about 70. And you can see that the people who are in the, uh, who have a high methylation age, so that is that their, their, their biological age is higher than their chronological age, die sooner than the people who's higher uh, than the people whose uh, methylation age is, is lower than their chronological age. So it really is. I mean, it is like seeing someone who's super wrinkled but, but, but young. Um, they're probably not doing too well health-wise. But we can tell that directly from a DNA test. And this is replicated not just in the Lothian birth cohorts, but across several other studies now. And I think it's now been replicated in about seven different cohorts. This seems to be real, um, this, this, this finding. Um, and that was one of the things, so my colleague, uh, Dr. Ricardo Marioni, uh, led the research on that, on that topic. But just to bring this back around to the thing that we've been uh, 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 discussing, is that we also did a, a paper where we looked at these physical measures and the cognitive measures, the intelligence uh, measure, um, in relation to methylation age. And so you see here, people who have, so this is the correlation with, so delta age is the, the extent to which your methylation age differs from your, your chronological age. People who, have, who are like biologically older than they should be have lower intelligence, they have lower grip strength, they have lower lung function, and there's no significant effect on, um, on their, walking, their walking speed. So this, uh, this is another age, aging indicator that seems, to, that seems to tell you quite a lot about people's cognitive and physical uh, aging. And now you can get it directly from the DNA. So the next few years, we're gonna be working on why is it that some people have higher methylation age than others? What is the, what is the story there? One thing we, that, that we know is really strongly related to methylation is smoking. If you smoke, your DNA is way more methylated than, than, uh, than, than someone who doesn't smoke. And in fact, you can tell, if I, if I took a methylation signal from everyone in this room, I could tell you exactly who the smokers are. Um, and in fact, I could tell you who's given up smoking but doesn't smoke currently, compared to people who, 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 have, never, who have never smoked. I could, I could easily tell you that information. It's, it's, it's like sticks out like a sore thumb. Is that a phrase you have in Spain? In, in, in the UK, we say sticks out like a sore thumb. I don't really know what it means. Um, yeah, so um, uh, smoking seems to be one thing. But we don't know what the other aspects are, if it's uh, someone's, some, uh, any other lifestyle aspects, drinking or um, uh, uh, stress at work, uh, childhood experiences. It could be any of these things. 
which cause the DNA to become methylated and, uh, and therefore maybe make their, this person's biological clock run a little bit faster. Um, and uh, seemingly gives them, uh, gives them lower levels of, of physical uh, and cognitive abilities in, um, in, uh, in old age. So that's a little summary of some of the stuff we've been doing uh, related to aging in the, in the cohort. And then since this is a future-oriented seminar, I will uh, tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the future with our cohort. So as I said, right now, there'll be someone in the scanner being, being uh, scanned. So we'll, we'll soon have three waves of, of neuro imaging data and four waves of, of cognitive testing and physical testing. So we'll be able to do much more interesting models uh, with, with four waves than you, than you can with, with you know, two or three waves. We'll be looking at how these, not just how these physical abilities predict brain change, but how they change together. So that's the kind of obvious next thing that we haven't, uh, that we haven't done, is to see whether people whose grip strength declines, you know, what aspects of the brain does that relate to, if any. Um, people's methylation uh, changes, uh, as I said, it doesn't just change right across the lifespan, but it, ch it changes even within the waves of our, of our study. So let's see if, uh, if the, 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 the methylation changes are relating to uh, particular changes in the brain or particular changes in cognitive uh, uh, abilities as we, as we age. We're also, I was talking to Dan, Dan, Danielle about this at, uh, at uh, uh, lunchtime, we're, we're also taking uh, stem cells from the participants um, so the, these little, um, oh, this came up with the wrong thing. So these are uh, vacutainers um, of, of, of blood. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're larger blood samples, which then go into um, special containers, which we're taking off to create uh, stem cells from which we can grow neurons from these people. So we've scanned their brains, uh, and that's one way of accessing what people's brains are like. We're going to grow brain cells in a dish from these participants as well. Um, that's the next, the next thing we're going to do. And we're going to take brain cells from people who have aged very badly and brain cells from people who have aged very well and look at the, uh, and test them, stress test these neurons under different conditions in the lab um, and, uh, and, and see whether uh, they have, um, you know, uh, whether there are, there, are, there are cellular aspects that can tell us anything else about, their, uh, about, about cognitive aging. And we're actually testing them way beyond their death as well because many of them have, uh, have given us their brain uh, in a post-mortem uh, brain bank as well. So currently we've got four uh, of them so far. Um, one of our team always has a phone on them at all times, which might ring at any time when someone has died, which is a sad thing to have, um, but it's also quite good from a scientific perspective, but, but really sad, but quite good. So, um, so, so we're, we're getting, we're getting, getting uh, the brains uh, coming in. So basically the, the relative phones up and says, you know, my mother has died and we have to say, get her in the freezer as soon as possible. So, you know, you've got to have a, you've got to have a harsh, um, you know, mentality to, to be a, a, an aging scientist, a scientist of aging. We're all aging scientists. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing next. So maybe next time I see you, we'll, I'll, I'll have some results from, from some of these, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, studies as well. So yeah, just, you know, we're amazingly grateful. I know I just made a joke about it being good that they're dying, but of course it isn't. We're super grateful to the participants in the Lillian Birth Cohort study for coming in over and over again and, and, uh, and doing these tests. Um, my my co-authors and, and, and bosses and uh, collaborators, mainly Ian Deary, who is the guy who set this whole study up, but I've been working with Elliot Tucker Draub at the University of Austin, uh, Texas. It's the University of Texas at Austin, I should say. Ricardo Marioni is uh, Mr. Methylation, and Simon Cox is, uh, does a lot of our brain stuff. We've got a whole team of people working on the study. Feel free, if you want any of these references, to email me or tweet me or send me a Snapchat. Don't send me a Snapchat. Please don't send me a, please don't send me a Snapchat. Just, just, just these two methods of communication are fine. Um, thank you very much for listening. Cheers.